Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this fireside chat on Asia in a challenging world, jointly organized by the International Monetary Fund, the Academy of Finance, and the HKIMR. I'm Casey Kwok, Chief Executive Officer of the AOF. We're very pleased to have Mr. Krishna Srinivasan and Mr. Eddie Yu with us today. According to the IMF's latest economic forecast, global growth would slow from 3.4% last year to 2.8% in 2023, with risks to this outlook heavily skewed to the downside, given uncertainties in geopolitics and inflation and potential financial sector stresses. Looking further ahead, Global growth is expected to remain around 3% over the next five years. This forecast of 3% over the five-year horizon makes it the lowest medium-term growth projection since 1990. However, against this rather gloomy outlook, Asia-Pacific remains a dynamic region. With growth projected to increase this year, to 4.6% from 3.8% last year. This means that the Asian region will contribute around 70% of global growth this year. China's reopening is an important contributor to this dynamism. In today's fireside chat, Krishna and Eddie will discuss many important issues concerning the regional economies, such as the impact of inflation and interest rates, the recent banking turmoil in the US and Europe, um, Hong Kong's most recent developments in areas such as the offshore renminbi market, central bank digital currency, and green finance, and so on. One topic that is of particular interest is how the international monetary system would evolve with rising risks of geoeconomic fragmentation and rapid technological in uh, innovation. And how should we deal with it? Mr. Krishna Srinivasan is the director of the Asian and Pacific Department of the IMF, overseeing the IMF's work on all the countries in the Asia Pacific region. He has been with the, with the IMF since 1994 and has served in several departments across the fund. Mr. Eddie Yu is the chief executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. All of us know Eddie very well here. I don't think he needs any further introduction. After the fireside chat, we will have some time for Q&A. So please get your questions ready. Today's discussion will be on the record. The video recording will be posted on the websites of the IMF and AOF, as well as the AOF YouTube channel afterwards. Without further ado, let's invite our two speakers today to come on to the stage. Uh, Krishna, Eddie, please. Okay. I'll hand over the floor to Eddie. Eddie, please. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to have Krishna here today. Uh, he just launched the Regional Economic Outlook for Asia this morning, uh, right in this room. Uh, so I think I'll just go right into the first uh, question, which is, what are the key messages that you have on the regional, uh, in, in your publication, the Regional uh, Economic Outlook? Uh, and what kind of risks and uh, uh, ch challenges, the prospects for the region uh, that you can see. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks again for hosting uh, me for this event here. In fact, Casey summarized a lot of my messages, so he stole the thunder. Uh, <laughs> but let me begin by saying that the global backdrop of Asia is quite sobering. Mm. Uh, we had global growth declining from 6% in 2021 to 3.4%, 2.8%, and then 3%. The 3% is something which is going to be or the medium term growth, mm. the lowest we've had in decades. So that tells you how, I mean, how the global uh, outlook is. Now, compared to that, uh, Asia is a very dynamic region. Uh, we have growth in Asia at 4.6% this year, leveling up at 4.4%. Now, these aggregate numbers mask the heterogeneity in the region. For the advanced economies, advanced economies in, in Asia, we have growth at 1.6%. Uh, mm. 
And for the emerging markets in Asia, we have it at 5.3%. Uh, mm. And for the emerging markets, the 5.3% reflects strong growth in two uh, countries in particular. China, uh, we revised our growth projection from 4.4% in October to 5.2%. Uh, and that reflects the rapid opening up of the economy, uh, restraints uh, uh, related to the pandemic, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic. And you know, in, in October, when we had done the forecast for China, we thought the opening would be more gradual, mm. so there'd be a more bumpy uh, transition. But they opened up the economy sooner than we, we thought, and much faster in terms of the steps. So we have China growing at 5.2%, which is one of the big drivers of uh, growth in the region. And uh, again, compared to the past, we expect growth in China this year to be led largely by consumption. Mm. In the past, we've had, whenever we had an uptick in growth in China, it was led by investment, infrastructure investment, and so on. But in this year, it's going to be consumption-led recovery, in large part because consumption was thoroughly repressed during the pandemic. A lot of savings, which was there to be spent. And so we see that, in fact, if you look at the quarter one figures, we can see that uh, consumption has been a big driver. There are downside risks. And one downside risk in China is, of course, the property sector, hmm. where we are still worried because, in some sense, because of the support provided by the government, the sector has stabilized at weak levels. But still, it is a downside risk uh, for, for, the, for, the, for, for China. Beyond that, we have an external, uh, both US and Europe are slowing quite sharply. Hmm. US, we have at 1.6% this year and 1.1% next year. Europe is, again, 0.8 and 1.4. So the external for the region out there, mm. including for China. Beyond China, we have uh, India, which is growing at 5.9%. Mm. We have marked down India's forecast by 0.2 percentage for this time around, largely reflecting uh, a slowdown uh, in consumption. Mm. But if you look at services export, it's booming in India. So India and China put together account for 50% of global growth this year. Mm. And Asia overall is about 70%. So in some sense, global growth is being driven largely by Asia. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that everything is hunky-dory in Asia. Mm. Uh, inflation, it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, worldwide. We have inflation, global inflation, 7% end of this year. In Asia, inflation has not been such a big factor compared to, say, Latin America, rest mm. of the world. But still, headline inflation, while moderating because of a slowdown in commodity prices, logistical costs, and so on, a lot of inflation, headline inflation, is being, is being explained by core inflation. Mm. And core inflation in Asia is very sticky. And again, there we point, for two thing, uh, we point at two factors. One is output gaps are either closed or they've already closed. That's the first factor. The second factor is that in our analysis, we find that when inflation is high, pass-through from exchange rate depreciations have been bigger and mm. they last for longer. Mm. So for both these factors, we believe that uh, inflation is going to be with us for some time. So the advice to uh, banks in the region, central banks in the region, is to keep the tightening focus. Mm. And so we think it's going to be tighter for longer. The second factor is debt. Mm. Uh, in Asia, Asia's share of debt has gone up from 25% pre-pandemic to 38%. This is not just uh, public debt, it's public debt, non-financial corporate debt, and household debt. Mm. So in the context of high interest rates, I mean higher for longer, and debt being high, we think uh, it is going to be a factor to watch out. There are mm. many countries in the region which are either in debt distress or debt which is unsustainable. Mm. So that's an issue we have to worry about. Right, right. So these are the short-term risks. We can talk about the longer-term challenges right, uh, right. going forward. Right, I, I just mentioned that, uh, you know, how Hong Kong fits into that, that yes. picture. Uh, basically, the, the description that you have for China fits very well with Hong Kong in that we open up quite quickly and we see consumption going up, partly because of the influx of tourists mm -hmm. uh, from China. If you go on to Canton Road today, you, can, you will see the queues in front of all these luxury shops. Uh, so uh, consumption has been uh, quite strong, retail sales quite strong. Uh, but of course, with the slowdown uh, in global economy, uh, export will be, uh, will be under pressure. Uh, and it will continue to be under pressure for, the, for, uh, for some time. So we will, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, annual 
uh, growth of about three and a half to five uh, percent. Mm -hmm. uh, the government just announced this morning that our Q1 uh, GDP growth was 2.7 percent, which is not bad given the performance in the next mm -hmm. quarter. Uh, inflation around the region, you know, has been lower than uh, the uh, the uh, the Western uh, uh, economy. In Hong Kong, it's been quite tame. Uh, you know, it's been around 1.8 percent. Uh, even for this year, the expectation is for that to rise marginally to 2.5 percent. Mm -hmm. Partly because a good part of our our CPI is actually uh, on housing rental, which is quite flat uh, throughout. So we are seeing quite nice rebound in Hong Kong and also very resilient and stable financial system here. But of course, one thing that, one, one development that will have a big impact on Hong Kong and, uh, and also Asia will be the growth in uh, mainland China sure. and how it's going. And you just talk about it will be consumption driven, uh, the rebound is actually quite fast. But I also note that you know, for the short term economic growth, uh, you have revised up China's growth. But for the medium term, you have actually slightly revised it down. Can you explain a little about the rationale for that, for those revisions, and where do you see the risks and prospects for the medium term in particular? And if you were to advise the government, what kind of policy mix do you think they should pursue? Sure. So, so to your very specific question, Eddie, on China, you're absolutely right. You have to put, you have to put uh, things in context. So while we have increased uh, the short-term forecast, for the medium term, we have revised China's uh, growth forecast to 3.4%. Mm. You know, not too long ago, it was upwards of, you know, close to six, 5 and 6%. We have revised it down to 3.4%. Now, this 3.4% is in the context of a no reform scenario. Mm. What do I mean by that? So what we've done is, in, 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 a, in October, in the World Economic Outlook, we looked at various factors which could stifle or which could impede growth in China. One factor, of course, was the population aging, which is true for uh, Hong Kong, too. Mm -hmm. uh, productivity has been a decline in China, right. which is an important factor. So those two factors. And we've, we've seen that there's a huge difference in productivity between the SOE sector and the private sector in China. And in the context of uh, you know, slowing uh, uh, population growth, mm. uh, uh, the skill base is right. something which so for these three factors put together, we have lowered uh, our forecast for 3.4. Mm. But we also make it quite clear that in the context where the government is able to say, uh, address these concerns, for mm. example, uh, the population aging mm. through a gradual increase in retirement age, mm. which will, which will uh, you know, feed into the labor force, mm -hmm. uh, allowing greater participation of women in the labor force, that's important. And narrowing productivity through innovation technology mm. is uh, important. And what we call as competitive neutrality between the SOEs mm. and the private sector. Mm. And finally, uh, I think what is more, the, uh, another factor is skilling the labor force, you know, mm. retooling them. I think it will be very important for China. So if these reforms are done along labor market reform, uh, you know, technology uh, uh, in terms of education reform and so on, we think the... Uh, Upside potential is quite significant. Mm. You could go from 3.4% to 4.5%. I see. So the no reform scenario was the reform scenario is where right. uh, is a distinction. And of course, what happens in China will have an important bearing on the rest of Asia. And uh, that's where our analysis finds that for every one percentage point increase in Chinese growth, mm. rest of Asia grows on average by 0.3 percentage points more. It's right. symmetric. So Decline 0.3 percent, up is 0.3 percent. So right. that's going to be very important for Asia. Right, and, and and I think the the issue that you talk about is also faced by many other Asian countries, aging, how to increase productivity, uh, how to really replenish the labor force by extending mm -hmm. retirement benefit. It could be controversial. It could be. We can see, see in see that one in country time. in Europe. Yes. Uh, but yes. but it's something that uh, all governments will have to think about. Uh, in order to promote the, the medium-term, longer-term growth. Uh, well, let me turn a little to another issue. That's actually mentioned also in the regional economic outlook, mm -hmm. as well as the world economic outlook. Uh, the IMF has coined this term geoeconomic fragmentation. It's quite widely discussed when I was in D.C. Uh, a few weeks earlier right. for the spring meetings. 
how do you think this uh, geoeconomic fragmentation might impact Asia, uh, especially uh, you know, in terms of our economy, uh, and how can we reduce the adverse effects of this fragmentation, especially what IMF and other stakeholders can do in terms of multilateral collaboration in order to reduce the impact of that fragmentation? That's a great question, Eddie. Again, we can go on for this for an hour or more. But let me, give, let me draw from what we did in our regional economic outlook in uh, last October. Mm. We did a scenario where we said, what if the world fragments into two blocks? One, which supports the war in Ukraine, or, or remains neutral, mm. and the other, which is opposed to the war in Ukraine. Mm. And if, 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 if trade between these two uh, blocks is impeded, which goes beyond the high-tech sector, and energy sector, it includes all kinds of uh, trade restrictions, mm. tariffs, non-tariff barriers, and so on. What would be the impact? Mm. And what we find in that very simple scenario is that everybody will be hurt. Asia will be hurt the most. Mm. Asian GDP, uh, sorry, three percent of GDP loss. Mm. Mm. It varies from country to country, but mm. overall, everybody loses. Right. Asia loses the most. Well, Krishna, can can I stop you for a minute? Because I thought uh, sometimes you're losing your voice because there are audience online. So maybe okay. you can also use that one as a supplement. Okay. So, so basically that was a starting point when we did the scenario on fragmentation. Because what was the genesis for this? Mm. We saw that over the last five to ten years, trade uncertainty had been rising sharply. Right. Which was causing a lot of consternation. It was not just in uh, US and China, but it was general rise in trade uncertainty, mm. which was hampering investment and growth. Mm. And then you had the tariff war uh, US-China, right. which we had quantified. And just the impact of the tariff between US and China mm. led to uh, what we estimate a 0.4% decline in global GDP in 2022. Mm -hmm. So that was a genesis to look at what happens if fragmentation happens, especially after the war, things had gotten pretty worse. Mm. So that led us to this scenario which we did, which was specific to Asia. Mm. Significant losses, everybody's hurt, uh, and so on. Of course, some people argue that some countries could benefit in the short term. And mm. the answer is yes. In the short term, we could fight over the slice of pie, mm. but over the long term, the pie becomes smaller. Right, right. Now, since then, we've done more work on that. And uh, we've done that in the World Economic Outlook uh, this time around. Mm. Again, the scenarios could be different. You could think in terms of which countries, which sectors, what kind of tariff barriers, mm. and what kind of simulation you could do. Mm. In the worst case scenario, where you have just, say, Russia being uh, the one which gets uh, isolated, create the rest of the uh, region, the rest of the world happens, mm. then the loss is about 0.4% of GDP. Mm. But in the worst scenario, it is 7% loss of global GDP, which is the sum of the annual output of Japan and Germany, that big. Right. To that, you add technological decoupling, which you see all of that right now, mm. the loss could be as high as 12% of global GDP. Mm. So you, this is a serious risk we're talking about. Mm. The question is, how do we avoid? I think everybody has to chip in. We all have to think in terms of, uh, of multilateralism, how to protect mm. uh, uh, the force which led to so many people uh, coming out of poverty, so many jobs and created globalization. So we have to work collaboratively, cooperatively on this, on this issue. Uh, to the extent possible, reduce trade uncertainty, reduce trade frictions. Mm. Uh, you have regional trading agre uh, agreements, mm. which are good, but there are many agreements, uh, like a spaghetti bowl. Uh, so you have to make sure they are not exclusive, Mm. The more countries are participating in that. Mm. So that's the only way to go. Mm. And uh, I think for, for Hong Kong, if you think in terms of financial fragmentation, right. that could be significant. Mm. So there are many aspects of fragmentation mm. which one needs to consider. But whatever be the model, whatever be the scenario, mm. everyone hurts, nobody wins. Uh, maybe temporarily somebody wins, but not uh, over a period of time. Right. In, in fact, apart from the loss in output, uh, in the central bank community, we talk quite a lot about the impact of uh, whether you call it decoupling, French shoring, near shoring, deglobalization. Uh, there will be impact on prices as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. It, it's got to be inflationary, and that will further complicate the whole monetary policy uh, formulation, right? How, right. how do you see this? 
I think it's apt. I mean, it could take many forms, right? Right. I think the some of the exercise we have done is just through the impact on productivity, mm. how that affects. Some we have gone beyond productivity and said, what happens if investment is affected? Right. FDI is affected. Now, all these forms tell you one thing: mm. that any form of fragmentation will cause consternation across the world. Right. Nobody wins. And for central bankers, it's going to be a bigger problem because mm. one of the reasons why we saw inflation, great moderation, mm. was because of globalization right. leading to you know, prices coming down and so on. If that breaks, you are likely to see inflation being a lot more persistent, mm. you know, sticky, and then central banks have a bigger challenge. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that until now, uh, the great moderation inflation was in decline and so on and so forth. You had, a, you had a world where you had interest rates being low for a very long time, mm. and that was made possible because inflation was muted. Mm. Now we have uh, you know, inflation being, uh, being high across mm. the world. And in that context, if you have fragmentation, mm. it poses a bigger challenge for central bankers like you, right? right? So it's an important. How do you see? How do you see the world uh, in the fragment in the, the context well, of fragmentation? <laughs> um, Hong Kong is right in the middle of it. Yes. Uh, and I, I think in terms of the um, the uh, various trade restrictions that you talk about, it's already happening. Uh, we, but but I have a sense that it will probably remain in certain strategic area, mm -hmm. technology, AI, uh, and certain maybe semiconductors. Uh, but in general trade, I still believe that everybody sees the merit of it, uh, and I, ho I just hope that there won't be uh, excessive restrictions on the general uh, export segment uh, that most countries have. Uh, in terms of the financial uh, system, I think it's too globalized and too intertwined for any decoupling to happen. It, it's, it's a very global financial system. You can't say, hey, there's an Asian uh, FX market here that cannot trade with a Western right. uh, FX market. Um, and for that, I think the important thing to do is really to make sure that Hong Kong plays the role as an international financial center. And then we continue to serve as an effective bridge that will link the world with, Asia, uh, with China. Whether you're talking about capital going into the Chinese assets or coming into Asia, or Chinese capital going out to the world, Hong Kong could be a bridge. And here we've been developing a lot of uh, mutual access schemes. We've been developing Hong Kong as the leading offshore R&B center. And I think that trend will continue. The liquidity facility that we have for R&B has been strengthened by a very big swap arrangement with PBOC. Mm -hmm. And we will continue to add RMB products, like RMB equities, uh, into our market in the middle of the year. And that will facilitate global investments into RMB. Uh, and the, on the other developments, Hong Kong has to be at the forefront as well. In order that we can keep our role as international and global center, things like uh, the use of technology, uh, the introduction of blockchain uh, into the financial system, uh, our innovation with CBDC, uh, the various pilots that we jointly do together with other jurisdictions on how to use CBDC uh, for cross-border payment, mm -hmm. our role in uh, green, uh, the building the green finance ecosystem, serving as the platform for um, Chinese corporates and Chinese government, in fact, uh, to access global capital for, um, for, tra for financing their tra green transition. I think all these are areas that we need to continue to build and attract international interest so that we will remain the center uh, for their financial system. I still believe that uh, fragmentation is more unlikely in finance, and Hong Kong will continue to be the, the center of it. Uh, so that's how I say uh, what, what, what do you think about Hong Kong's role in, in all these uh, sort of uh, trends towards different fragmentation, and, and how do you see financial fragmentation? Uh, you know, I, I've expressed how I think about it. I just, I'm just interested. You so, know. so I want to distinguish between uh, two kinds of financial fragmentation. Right. One is, of course, the the, the fragmentation which happens through FDI fragmentation. Mm. I think that is something that's a risk which is clearly uh, much more upon us, because if you go back to the literature where you know, we all talked about investment following trade, the linkages between trade and FDI. Mm. So 
you could think of a world where uh, 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 investment decisions are hampered because of geopolitics. Right. Right? Because of various considerations. Uh, you've seen that happening right now. You, yeah. it may not, you may not see the aggregate. People keep asking me, have you seen uh, data of firms moving out of China uh, into other countries? If I look at high frequency data, uh, I don't see that so much, but mm. anecdotes are rampant. Right. If I look at aggregate data on FDI, you see some movement, but it's not alarming, mm. right? But you could think of FDI location decisions being affected because of trade patterns, because right. trade follows FDI and, and vice versa. Financial fragmentation, the way Hong Kong is, it's, mm. to me, it's less, again, it's mm. a personal view, is that it could be less of an issue. In, in actually, in that context, I just want to push you a little bit. Mm. You said you were very humble in saying that, you know, Hong Kong is reading its role. But given the fact that Hong Kong is going to, is the gateway, financial mm. gateway for China, mm. and the fact that there's going to be a lot more internationalization of, of the renminbi and of transactions, right. do you see that the Hong Kong will have a scale factor which some other financial centers won't have and so actually Hong Kong will be more important than, than before? Do you see that? As well, if, if, if the RMB is more widely used in uh, international transactions, uh, for sure, given Hong Kong's lead as an offshore RMB center, and given the scale and infrastructure that we have, we will probably run a lot faster than any other financial centers. And there, there will be great potential for that, because if you look at the external trade of China, Currently, only about 18% of that is denominated in RMB. Right. And for an economy as big as China, which is you know, now about 18, 20% of global economy, uh, um, you know, it's justifiable that a larger percentage of their trade, that could be de denominated in RMB. If that, if that happens, there will be the trade counterparties who might have received RMB and want to invest. And for them to do that effectively, and also in a very comfortable way, Hong Kong will be the place because it's a place where they are familiar with in terms of the use of common law, mm -hmm. the use of international practice and standards, and the assurance that capital coming in can flow out anytime. So if I were you know, receiving RMB as a result of the wider use of RMB in trade and investment, I would pick Hong Kong as the place to be for my RMB investment. So I, I, I do see an outsized role uh, for Hong Kong in terms of uh, the future, uh, uh, R&B uh, uh, capital markets development. Uh, and well, you know, before I turn to the, uh, to the floor for questions, uh, let me ask you the question that uh, Casey talked about, which is the future of the international monetary system. You talk about the wider use of R&B. And in the market, there are more talks about uh, whether US dollar will continue to be the uh, only reserve currency, or whether there could be a multipolar world. And then we're also seeing the rise of the use of technology, where you see crypto assets coming in, digital money coming in, central banks talking about the use of central bank digital currencies, uh, and the social media is you know, really driving a lot of flows these days. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the whole international monetary system uh, going forward? Uh, with all these developments? It, it's a very broad and difficult it's, it's, question it's, it's as well. A very broad, <laughs> it's a very broad question, so I'm going to keep my answer also very broad. Okay? Right. <laughs> uh, tit for tat. Right? Uh, so uh, I, I pointed to one aspect of uh, monetary uh, international monetary stability and so on. One is we as the international community are moving from uh, a, a, a scenario of where interest rates were low for long, mm. right? We talked about the great moderation, inflation being low, and so on and so forth. Now we're going to a situation where interest rates are, going, are high, mm. and in some parts of the world, they could be high for long. That's something which we have to deal with in terms of mm. what implications it has. We also are living in a situation where uh, growth is slowing, inflation is, is, is on the higher side, and you have financial stability risks coming to the fore in some cases. Mm. So there are trade-offs which you know, central bankers didn't have to contend with in the past, and they had to contend with now. Mm. You also see debt, ri debt levels rising across many parts of low-income world and mm. also some parts of the emerging world. So there is a rise debt distress. In addition to that, we have some old and new challenges. Mm. Climate change, right. fragmentation, mm. digital money. Right. 
And on top of that, now you have the issue of AI, what does it mean for jobs? Mm. So you have many, many things to contend with. So what are we doing as an institution, as an international community mm. to deal with that? From a very, um, from the IMF perspective, what we are doing is this has um, intensified our role of surveillance mm. in terms of our role in financing mm. and in terms of providing capacity development support for countries. Mm. Now, in terms of the global financial safety net, we have, um, we think in terms of four layers, right? We have countries build their own reserves, the first protection. Then you have swap arrangements between central banks. Mm. You have, uh, you know, the, the IMF, and then you have the regional financing arrangements. Mm. How do all these things come together? Mm. I think that's an issue which we have to contend with. Right. And again, the one issue where uh, uh, we have to think in terms of is how, as an international community, mm we deal with these great transitions I talked about, fragmentation, mm. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, uh, AI, digitalization, right. and so on. I think these are the challenges we have to face collectively. Mm. Mm. Right. Well, there's one area that uh, has generated quite a lot of thoughts and interest uh, in Hong Kong, and we are actually one of those that come up with a policy framework uh, quite clearly, which is the uh, increased interest in virtual assets. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you call it crypto, blockchain, innovation, stable coin, or, or whatever, there are many forms of it. We still don't know whether it will become more mainstream in future, but definitely it has survived different winters. Uh, and it, it has actually uh, developed into a more sort of widespread suite of different products. In Hong Kong, we are very clear. Uh, we thought that it's a trend that there's no reason to ban it. There's no reason that we should not allow it. We've been very strict with it because we don't know how it will develop. But now that the development is more mature, the collective uh, policy stance that we take is to regulate instead of to ban. We want to make sure that the guardrails are there. And the guardrails are as straight as any other financial activities. Basically, same risk, same activity, same regulation. So we're building up a regulatory regime for our uh, virtual asset trading platform. We are putting together a legislation for stable coins. Uh, we are providing additional guidance for banks and brokers if they want to deal with crypto or other virtual assets. But we do believe that this could be a trend, whether you know, it's decentralized finance or some form, of de -tokenize, some form of tokenization, it will come in. How, how does the fund look at it? And how do you see the developments in Asia in this area and how it will impact our financial system? Again, it's a very good question. This whole issue of digitalization, digital money, and so on, I think there are aspects of it which are endearing. Mm. It's, it reflects, uh, in some sense, innovation. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, many minds are working in, the, in, in trying to innovate and so on. And they clearly have some advantage in terms of making the payment systems more efficient, mm. financial inclusion, and so on. At the same time, they carry risks for consumers, mm -hmm. for investors, there's an aspect of protection of consumers and investors. Mm. And of course, there's a the whole issue of AML CFT, mm. which hasn't gone away. So the question is, there are, there are benefits, there are risks. Now, uh, you know, as you know, India is the president of the G20 this time. Right. One of the things they asked us to do is they said, you know, we talk about these uh, crypto assets, we talk about um, you know, uh, other kinds of digital money. Mm. But, and we talk about uh, banning or regulating them. Mm. Mm. But to make a decision whether to regulate or ban it, we have to understand the imp macroeconomic implications of these. Mm. So can you actually um, help us with that? So we did, we did a workshop in Delhi not too long ago mm. with all, all the regional uh, Asian regional partners there and mm. from other parts, and we discussed this. And mm. we had participants from various parts of Asia it was clear that the motivation mm. was different, how they saw the benefits they was different, how they saw the risks were different. Mm. But again, we talked about the fact that there could be currency substitution. Right, right. There could be financial uh, or banking disintermediation. Right. There could be the issue of consumer and investor protection. There could be the issue of that and AML safety. Right. So we brought these things to discussion. At the end, uh, we had a discussion not too long ago, and the Countries which have tried banning it said, mm. banning doesn't work because mm. people find a way to circumvent that. Mm. So everybody was converging towards the thing that 
you have to have good regulation, mm. good oversight, mm. and that's the way to go because mm. you're not being, you, innovation can take many forms and people will find a way if you right. try to ban it. So regulating it, watching it carefully, monitoring it is very important. Right. Uh, don't, because at the end of the day, there are many aspects which could be beneficial. Mm. The idea here is to make sure that you reap the benefits but protect against the risks. Right. And, and I think here the, the role of the fund will be very important because it's fast evolving. Yes. Uh, and the knowledge that different jurisdictions have about digitalization of finance, you know, varies quite a bit. And for, for the fund to distribute that knowledge, to do research on that, so that everybody will be on the same level, on the same page. I think that's important because you need globalized uh, coordination in regulation so that regulation could be effective. And in fact, uh, the IMF along with the FSB right. is doing some work on this which will, 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 will come out uh, later this year. All right. So, okay, issues. so uh, it's been a good discussion, Krishna. I'm sure that the audience have uh, all kinds of questions that they might be interested in. So let me open the floor uh, for the, uh, any questions from the audience. Uh, Casey, you will, you will moderate, all right? If you want to moderate, that's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, questions are welcome from the floor. If uh, you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. And yes, the gentleman, please. Uh, could you please identify yourself? Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, Stuart James from Goldman Sachs. So, uh, Krishna, if I can take you back in the conversation to, uh, you mentioned getting uh, a return to uh, a, very, a very positive development sort of uh, paradigm that we were in uh, before some of the geopolitical tensions. Um, from, from where you s sit in the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, what changes or reforms do you think emerging markets would seek in order to increase the legitimacy of the Bretton Woods institutions uh, and, and, and their usefulness uh, to emerging markets? Uh, great question, so I, I got your name right, Stuart, right? Yeah. Stuart, yes. Yeah. So I think um, at a time when we see uh, risks of fragmentation, rampant rise in uh, you know, trade uh, uncertainty, uh, protectionism, uh, the, the words you use, offshoring, French shoring, I think the IMF with the global membership has the ability to bring countries together, think through this, uh, uh, and say that at the end of the day, the whole issue we did on fragmentation, Stuart, is not to so show that there is a risk out there. The fact is everybody loses, and the mm. cost could be large. And to get people to buy into the fact that everybody loses, we all gain from coming together, I think that's the role which institutions like the uh, IMF can, can play. Mm. And to give you another example, uh, when this whole issue of debt distress, right? We, had, uh, we have countries in the, in the world which are having debt distress, trying to help these countries resolve the debt problems, you know, in a way which leads them to back to sustainability and so on, is an area where you know, the IMF and the World Bank came up with a, with a common framework. Uh, again, it was, there was slow progress on the common framework, but recently we had the Global uh, Sovereign Debt Roundtable mm -hmm. where we brought the, the official community, the private sector, the creditors and debtors to sit down and talk about why do we have delays in debt restructuring? What can we do to get things done better? And it was a, a good forum for people to you know, hear from each other, for the, for, the, for the Western world to hear what issues China had, India had what issue the creditors had. So that is the convening power we had, and we made some progress so that hopefully these debt issues can be resolved more expeditiously going forward. So I think when you talk about collective decision making, bringing people together, I think that's where the institution like the IMF play a big role. Mm. Thank you. Um, any Daryl, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Krishna. Uh, my question is about climate. So um, in recent years, we noticed that actually uh, IMF has put climate more on the center of your work. So can you tell us a bit more about that, the rationale behind that, and to what extent you think IMF can leverage on your unique position to really help um, us tackle climate risk? Great question. Uh, again, we've had internal debates on you know, the role of the fund in climate and so on. And I made this point at lunch today. 30% of our membership could go underwater 
if things go out of control, climate change. And I, I, before, before uh, being in the Asian department, I was in Latin America, where I oversaw the work on the Caribbean. Mm. And I've seen myself how a country like Dominica got hit by back-to-back -back Category 5 hurricanes and how the country was virtually decimated and how it came back. So there's clearly a role for uh, what we say in the context of uh, macro criticality. It's very important for the IMF to be there. Now again, uh, we, we can play a, a role, but we can't play the overarching role. So what have we done? We've recently come up with, um, so before going there, let me see. So in try, what, what we try to do in our article for surveillance and in our program work, we try to internalize climate risks into the macro fiscal framework to see what would be the demands on the country to address climate change. What would be the impact on the financial sector from climate change events? So that was the analytical, conceptual, thematic part of the work. Then not too long ago, as part of our SDR recycling, you know, we had, we, uh, we had a 650 billion SDR allocation. As part of that recycling of the SVR, we created what is called Resilient and Sustainability Trust. This is for countries which wish to address transformational changes like climate, pandemic preparedness, and so on. And in Asia, the first country to avail of that facility is Bangladesh. Mm. And the, the, whole, the whole idea of this RSF is that it would be jointly with the IMF program, where we would have conditionality which looks at, of course, a macro stabilization part of uh, the country, but also what could be the reforms that the country could take to address climate change, which would, among other things, catalyze private capital. So that at the end of the day, to address climate change, the public sector by itself cannot do it. You need the private sector. And this program, which brings the macro reforms and the micro reforms together, provides a way for the private sector to assess that the country is serious about addressing climate change. It's doing its part in terms of providing from the fiscal what it can, but what else does it need? Mm. And that's where we're going. So yes, we have an important role to play. We work very closely with the World Bank because the World Bank has expertise in this area. And, uh, we, and these programs we put together, now we have five countries uh, which have done this. In Asia, Bangladesh is the one. In fact, we had a very good lunch, uh, we had a very good discussion with Casey and others during lunch on how to get the private sector to be part of this uh, transition and addressing climate change. So well, that, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to add that uh, there's actually quite a lot that the HKMA and the IMF can work together. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we are organizing together with the fund a roundtable in June. Yes. Uh, that will also, in, well, we, we're, we're also trying to invite the private sector participants to come in and discuss with the IMF and us on how collectively we can provide uh, financing to different parts of Asia, not just Hong Kong or China, but also different parts of Asia. Right. I think that financing is one form. Uh, we are also trying to uh, work together with some private equity firm on equity financing. But some form of blended finance will be important where there could be certain public sector uh, guarantee or public sector support, but private sector has to play a role. Well, I think that there's an area that we can really Absolutely. group people together and find solutions. Absolutely. In fact, uh, the, uh, one of our management uh, person, uh, Bo Lee, is leading this work in trying to see how you could catalyze private capital to address uh, climate change. Because without private capital, we can't do it. But we have to be innovative, how to bring in the, the IFIs uh, you know, into this debate and right. so that you know, we could think of innovative solutions. But again, very important for the fund to be in, involved in climate uh, uh, studies, working jointly with other institutions and the private sector to address this problem. Because this is a huge problem uh, uh, from an from, from from a international community right. perspective. Okay, uh, Kim. Thank you. Uh, this is Kim from Hang Seng Bank. Uh, thank you, um, Eddie, and also Christmas uh, Insight for sharing. I have a question on CBDC to Eddie. Um, I know that there are a lot of discussions and also the, um, the, the discussion with the market and also the FIs regarding the implementation of e-Hong Kong dollar in Hong Kong, mm. uh, whether it is feasible for Hong Kong to implement e-Hong Kong dollar. I would like to understand is if there is any latest stance from Hong Kong MA mm. and also whether we will explore any interoperability with the ECNY. Thank you. Well, um, I, I think for the um, 
application of the CBDC, the e Hong Kong dollar, there are two levels. One is wholesale, and mm -hmm. that's definitely moving on. Uh, I mentioned uh, this project, Enbridge, that we are doing together with the People's Bank of China, uh, Bank of Thailand, the Central Bank of UAE, with about 13 observers, uh, including the IMF. Uh, it's actually a very uh, progressive pilot uh, that we are, we are conducting uh, using uh, CBDC as the means for real-time cross-border uh, payment. Uh, that can cut down in terms of uh, the amount of time and also the cost. Uh, we, work, we are aiming for a minimum viable product towards the end of the year, uh, and we hope that it could help uh, with cross-border payment. So that will move on. Uh, but there's another leg of it, which is the retail use of uh, CBDC. Uh, on this, we are making all preparations in terms of the technology platform, the legal work, um, the policy work in terms of privacy versus uh, AML uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and anti-fraud. Uh, the security part of it is a very new technology. So we're doing a lot of groundwork. But more importantly, we call that the rail two. We have three rails. Rail one is the foundation work. Rail two is actually the use case. We want to make sure that if we were to introduce e Hong Kong dollar, it would be adopted. It will be either more efficient or less costly than current means of payment in the retail space, which is very diverse and efficient already. So we've invited different banks and uh, also technology firms to pull in their proposals, and we, we will open up a sandbox very shortly for them to try out in our sandbox the applications and the response. And if there should be good response, good use case, then we will move on to rail three, which is to prepare for implementation. But that second part, the use case is important. I, I'm just wondering whether uh, the IMF has got any observations on the use of CBDC, because you've been looking at uh, the adoption, the exploration of CBDC in different jurisdictions. Uh, how do people see both wholesale and retail CBDCs? Do they see it in the same way that we see it? I think it's absolutely along the way, way you see it. And I think we've had uh, a lot of countries doing pilots. Right. Like, and so I don't think anybody has actually mainstreamed it, mm. but they're working through pilots to see how effective it is, whether they can achieve the goals they uh, had set out for that. And so along the lines, exactly what you said is right. where it be. And right. we're getting more experience, uh, more uh, evidence and uh, analysis from countries so mm. that we could work with them. Right, this. right. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a very new area there again. Uh, collectively, if we can have some form of multilateral yes. uh, sharing of experience and information, I think that will be very helpful. Um, next question. Yeah. You can go. I have the mic. Uh, I'm a chief economist from JD.com. I used to work also in the IMF in Washington, oh. D.C. before. <laughs> so I just my question is that uh, your, uh, for Krishna, your, your, your projection about for Chinese growth o over the medium longer term is 3.4%. So also you mentioned that is a, is a non-reform scenario, right? So, so is it your base scenario? So this is a question. Secondly, have you also factored in the, the current you know, china uh, sino us you know, relation? Is it uh, the worsening you know, situation? Is it also factored in this 3.4% or has not been factored in? Uh, so this is the question. Uh, secondly, I want to ask uh, Eddie is, uh, you know, what Hong Kong as a financial center can play a role mm. in, you know, forge, forging uh, cooperation between China and U.S. relations so that they mm. can prevent a worse scenario? Uh, thank you for this question. So on the baseline, the baseline scenario of 3.4% is what we say is without the policies uh, being adopted. But we also say that if what, so the question is, you have a baseline scenario and say, we have revised on our growth forecast, medium term growth forecast of 3.4%. The question is, how could you increase it? What could be the upside potential? So that's why we talk about the policies which need to be pursued. And then we've quantified that by saying, if these policies are pursued, I talked about these policies, then your uh, upside potential is one percentage point. So it could be 4.5%. So the baseline is 3.4 uh, and so on. And your second question was on, um, on, on tariffs. Right, again, I'm going to ask Thomas to give a better answer on that one. Do we have <laughs> that? Uh, he, he oversees China, right? So do we have the ch uh, worsening of uh, US trade uh, relations in the baseline? No, right? No. no. 
So I, that's what I thought. So we don't have a worsening of the US trade relations. We write off where we are today. All right. Uh, I'll answer the second part, which is uh, Hong Kong's role. Uh, when we see all these uh, trade conflicts between US and China, I thought our role is really to play uh, the, uh, you know, to continue to strengthen uh, our services as a bridge linking China and the world. And the world, if you look at the global financial system, uh, the US participants, uh, the US based uh, investments still uh, is the majority. Uh, so if we maintain our current system, which is a very open system, common law system that people are, are, are familiar with, free flow of capital, to attract global investors, including US dollar based investors, to come into China through Hong Kong using our platform, I think we, we will actually weave them, continue to weave them in. In, you know, in any case, the global financial system, as, as I mentioned earlier, is very intertwined. And that intertwining will only be strengthened in the future, and Hong Kong will be right in the middle. So if we play our role right, uh, we will help to continue to weave in the whole uh, global financial system, thereby resisting any attempt or talks about decoupling. Okay. Um, yes, gentlemen. Oh. Uh, Krishna, this is uh, Edward from China City Bank International. I have one question for you. Uh, so what is your stance on the debt sustainability uh, for developing economies in the region, right? Uh, especially, particularly in light of increasing borrowing to fund their development projects. So again, when it comes to debt sustainability or debt uh, distress, there's a huge variation. There are some countries where we have assessed debt to be in distress. Uh, uh, again, maybe it's not good for me to name the countries. But we have, uh, if you look at our staff reports, I mean, some of them don't get published because of this exact reason when we say, when we call some, someone's debt not being sustainable. But we do have a whole spectrum of countries which where debt levels are very comfortable to countries where debt is in distress. And what we try to do is, and the, the, the unfortunate reality is uh, when, when countries, uh, countries try to push out however long they can, I mean, they take forever to reach out for help. So um, for some countries, Sri Lanka is a case in point, right? Where the debt we assess to be unsustainable, mm. okay? And, and then they came, for, came to the IMF for a program which was approved not, long, uh, not too long ago. In those cases, uh, the onus cannot fall fully on the country to do the fiscal consolidation. So the program we have on Sri Lanka, for instance, is uh, uh, based on fiscal consolidation, revenue-based fiscal consolidation, not expenditure cuts, uh, and also includes an element of debt restructuring so that debt could be made on a uh, sustainable basis. So there are countries like that which are in similar situation but do not have an engagement in that kind of context uh, with the IMF. Yes, the lady in the middle. Yes, yes. Um, thank you both. Very great conversations. So this is Helen Zhang from Moody's. Um, I have a question relating to the RMB interna internationalization for EDI. Um, so uh, RMB certainly they are uh, gain gaining shares in the global cross-border and international trade currencies, but still a very low proportion. So in your view, what are the challenges you see for it to gain uh, greater shares, especially from a invoice currency translate into a wider role, including the reserve currency? Mm. And, and how do you see the offshore liquidity issues and the capital con uh, account control issues would uh, affect that? And also the, uh, the offerings and availability of RMB investment products offshore and how Hong Kong uh, would play a role to facilitate and overcome these challenges. Thank mm. you. Well, um, I, I think it will take a long time for any currency to be widely adopted in international trade and investments. Uh, primarily because one, there's great inertia. If you've been using uh, a practice or a currency for a long time, you need to change your system, you need to change uh, the way that you invest, you need to change maybe your payments arrangements, so there's actually great, very big inertia uh, in terms of especially trade uh, payments. Uh, and secondly, you need the markets and infrastructure to be there. And that, again, needs time to build. Hong Kong is already making a great head start in terms of the offshore RMB liquidity and also RMB capital markets. As I said, 
Uh, even in the capital markets, I think RMB bonds is quite vibrant here, but we still don't have RMB equities. So it, it takes time to build all this infrastructure. Uh, and also, the business arrangement also takes time to build. For example, if you were a, um, a trade counterparty of China in the Middle East, if you want to, to denominate your, or settle your trade in RMB, if you ask your banker in uh, Saudi Arabia or UAE, they may not know how to do it. They may be short of liquidity. They don't know where to get the liquidity. And that's actually one reason why I will be bringing uh, the banking delegations from Hong Kong uh, in the latter parts of this month and also next, next month to both UAE and Saudi Arabia for them to talk to each other about business cooperation, mm -hmm. in particular in the RMB area. So if the, their clients in UAE or Saudi, if they want wider use of RMB for the trade, how can the Hong Kong banks help? If they've got RMB and want to invest, how can they invest through the banks and brokers in Hong Kong? I think a lot of these business collaboration uh, will be necessary on top of liquid capital markets and on top of the, uh, the, the uh, infrastructure. So these are the things that we are building and it takes time. I, I don't know whether Krishna, you, you share the same view. I, I agree with you. I think um, to the question, I think in, uh, if you look at trade invoicing in mm. dollars, I think it's highest in Asia. By across all regions, so even this gradual uh, remittance uh, use will take a longer time right. in Asia than in other regions. I feel right, right. So. And, and what we are trying to uh, talk to the banks is that even for Enbridge right. or other cross-border payments, uh, we try that out with trade finance uh, using blockchain. It's much faster, safer, and more efficient. But there's just no incentive for the small, especially the smaller and medium corporates to change their system. Absolutely. They will continue to bear with the time lag, uh, the uncertainty, rather than investing to change their system. So we need to work together with banks so that the banks and us jointly can provide some incentive to drive that change. Otherwise, as you said, it will take a very long time. It's a very long time. Uh, for That's any... what history tells you, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Darji. Thank you, Casey. And, uh, Thank you, Anne Krishna and Eddie, for a fantastic chat. And welcome back uh, to the region, Anne Krishna. So I, I'm Du Zhi. I'm working for the BIS Asian office here in Hong Kong. And uh, so uh, two of you have talked quite a bit about uh, uh, some of the challenges the region faces. And you alluded to a little bit how, um, how you can be helpful. So, so Krishna, could you uh, elaborate a little bit more about you know, uh, how the IMF can be more helpful uh, to the region in terms of you know the inflation rising inflation the fragmentation uh, and the debt and also for that matter how do you plan to work uh, closely with the regional institutions thank you yeah so i think when it comes to issues like inf uh, inflation uh, again it, this is done through our normal surveillance uh, with countries we have regular uh, engagement with all countries in the region where we talk about, and it's not that countries agree with us, central banks agree with us, but we do have a good discussion with them, uh, you know, give examples from what's happening elsewhere. So, so I think one thing which we have tried to do more is peer-to-peer. -peer. So when we talked about crypto, you know, the world of crypto, you know, rather than us going and telling uh, the Indian authorities the macro financial implications of crypto, we had mm. a bunch of uh, uh, people from the region talking you know, we had a brainstorming. Mm. And that was a more compelling uh, right. way to on some of these contentious issues. But on things like inflation, debt, fiscal, I think we do that through our regular uh, Article 4 consultation. On the broader issue of fragmentation, uh, I think what we could do is what we have been doing is to write, uh, uh, you, know, you know, show analysis of how fragmentation could hurt you know, how, why we should avoid it. You know, if you can, if, if it's not convincing enough to show that if 12% loss, global loss, if that is not convincing for people to get together, what is, right? But what we can do is, you know, the convening power uh, on uh, bringing people together. And again, there was a question on, you know, on debt. Same thing, you know, when you talk about how to help countries overcome debt distress and so on, uh, things like the common framework, the global the, uh, sovereign debt round table, these are ways by which you can bring various stakeholders together and impress upon them to need to uh, take corrective actions expeditiously. And, and I think the ability for us to travel physically also help a lot. Absolutely. You know, if, if you talk about, the, let's say, the Global Debt Roundtable, you know, doing it through Zoom, 
with China, India, and other major uh, countries plus IMF will never be as effective as people you know, sitting around a, totally a, a, a table to talk totally about that. Totally agree with that. I think that's, that's a big, big change. Uh, right. Yeah. And we had, for the first time, we had the Chinese authorities come in person to Washington, D.C., which made it easier to discuss with them on issues. Because, I mean, obviously, like what you said, Eddie, conveying something virtually is that much harder. And here, seeing uh, people uh, you know, in person helped uh, you know, strengthen the dialogue uh, for us. So you, you would expect to see Krishna a lot more here in Asia <laughs> than, than the last few years. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, our next question from Helen. Uh, thank you, Krishna and Eddie, for the very useful conversation exchange. My question is, my takeaway is Hong Kong um, in the midst of a lot of challenges uh, and yet a lot of opportunities mentioned by Eddie. So my question is more on the human side. Mm. Do you see signs that international high caliber talent, because we are an international financial center, returning to Hong Kong? Do you mm. see signs in that? And if not yet, uh, what can be done more? Right. Uh, well, let me, let me give you two uh, parts. One is anecdotal, which is what I hear from financial institutions day in, day out. Because uh, last year was difficult for us, especially since we opened our borders later than the others. Right. So we're seeing people uh, getting trouble, seeing their families, uh, and some actually left. But when I talked to the different financial institutions towards the letter of last year, people are already starting to return. And come this year when the border is fully open, I don't think they have any difficulty uh, recruiting people, whether it's from um, the Asia or Europe, uh, the US. Uh, people see the opportunities. And in, you know, after all, talents are attracted by where opportunities are. So they see the opportunities here, and I, I, I was hearing that they're coming back. And also, if you look at the new talent program mm. uh, that's created by the, by the government, it's just they have opened up application for just a few months. And there's already 33,000 applicants coming in. Uh, and that tells, uh, tells you a lot about how talent see Hong Kong as a place where you can find opportunities. So I, I, I think it's, it was a well, transitory, it's not a, big, it's not a good word. But uh, for Hong Kong, I think talent was a transitory issue. And now I, 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 I do think that uh, they, are, they are back uh, you know, attracted by opportunities. I agree. I think now that the pandemic is behind us, you should be able to attract uh, right. uh, human capital. And again, providing incentives the yeah. way you talked about, I think it will make a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, actually, time is up, but I couldn't uh, resist myself asking this question raised by somebody earlier. Uh, is there any lesson we could draw from the recent banking turmoil? And if I may add, <laughs> is the First Republic Bank the last one? Or what, what should we be watching on the horizon? <laughs> that, that's a good question for Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the, 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 the lesson here is mm. um, we have made a lot of progress around the world after the global financial crisis in terms of you know, banking regulation and supervision and so on. Uh, and, but I think trying to carve out exemptions from that, I think, is something which we need to revisit. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, why should a bank which has, you know, 250 billion uh, assets or less be mm. subject to less stringent prudential supervision and regulation? I think that's a question which we have to ask ourselves. I think, more importantly, um, I would say for, for, for in this region, we have seen uh, debt uh, increase in terms of uh, non-corporate debt, household debt, and so on. So uh, how do these things, where do the risks manifest ourselves? I think I, I was telling somebody at lunch, we have to be humble in accepting the fact that after so many years of interest rates being low for many years, you know, there are uh, pressures, there might be pressures building up. We have to be alert. We have to make sure that we catch them and nip them in the bud. Mm. And so not slacking off on prudential regulation and supervision mm. is extremely important for banks. Right. I'll just add two points. Uh, one is that, uh, of course, uh, tight regulation, maintaining sufficient buffers in capital and liquidity are important. Uh, but this time, we do see uh, what people call the digital run. Uh, the widespread uh, rumors around the social media, the speed that deposits are leaving. Of course, it, you know, in the case of SVB, it was very particular because 
Uh, they have a very big concentration of depositors. It's the same community. So the run was, uh, could be a lot faster, but digital run is something that I think as regulator we should uh, take another look on the uh, liquidity regime, on stress tests, et cetera. Uh, the second observation is that uh, this time round, uh, after SVB signature and even credit suites in the uh, case of Europe, uh, we've been looking at the sentiment around Hong Kong and also around Asia. The contagion is surprisingly low. Mm. Uh, when you look at the equity prices of banks in Asia, uh, the, deposit, the stability of deposits around Asian banks uh, is actually quite stable. And there's not a lot of rumors going around uh, suspecting that certain Asian banks could be in trouble or could be lightly regulated or whatnot. So I, I think the ability for the Asian banks, especially Hong Kong banks, to maintain um, ample uh, buffers actually helps uh, uh, retain that confidence even in the face of the banking events that we see in the US and, uh, and also Europe. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's give a big hand to Krishna and Eddie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you very much all for coming at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs>